Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Graham Weir, and I'm one of the partners here for the charity. Uh, thank you for attending our financial reporting update this morning. And once again, I'm pleased to um, have Colin Parker from uh, GAP Consulting here to give you uh, an update on uh, developments for this 30th of June. I think in particular, Colin to touch on again the new suite of uh, standards which uh, are now co-operative. 1st of January uh, this year about revenue of financial instruments. Uh, Colin's also going to probably touch on the potential demise of special purpose financial reporting. So for those that in the room which do um, cover the best special purpose accounts, um, there's some um, developments in that space. And uh, also a bit of an update on what uh, the regulator um, ASIC have uh, been doing in the last uh, 12 months. So thank you, Colin. Thanks, Graham. So, Always a pleasure to uh, be asked back to share my passion of uh, with financial reporting and also to uh, partake in the discussion with a number of familiar faces and to uh, support my uh, good friends here at Hall Chadwick. Uh, as you can see by the uh, by the graphic, I've changed it since we were here uh, last year. It's the, my message is that it's the calm before the storm and uh, Graham touched on the issues about the forthcoming storm uh, with the new accounting standards. If you look at that skyline, it's really not a uh, Sydney skyline because when we have uh, the storms coming in here in Sydney, you have those incredible uh, electricity shows, the lightning and, and the downpour. So, Perhaps the move to the new accounting standards will uh, reflect uh, uh, that such a downfall. So, for those that uh, don't know me, I'm a uh, run a consultancy uh, business called uh, Gap Consulting. We have eight in my team, including uh, a lawyer, <laughs> countless lawyers and uh, Carmen Ridley, who's a, a member of the ASP, so we're all specialists in accounting, auditing standards, and risk management. So one should have a, a disclaimer. I know nothing, I see nothing. And those that sort of my generation, that's the Sergeant Schultz, and our Hogan Zero and so claim. So this is for training, but I'm happy to uh, share insights and ask uh, questions at the end of that. So I have an agenda. So what is my agenda today, other than to provide uh, some humorous comments every now and then? One or two people will get to my way jokes, if they are jokes. So I've broken the presentation up into uh, four areas. One, I will get accounting standards that are right, going to impact us as at 30th June. Uh, then I want to look at what the corporate regulator is focusing in upon. I want to touch on some ethical issues and also some horizon issues. Why? Because I really want you guys, in a non-sexist way, to uh, appreciate the changes that are coming through and that you can put these on your agenda. Now, some of the changes coming through, which I'll speak to in a moment, are quite massive and they really uh, don't fit uh, an update like this. Using tips on how we're going to uh, take a look. So, accounting standards. So, as you can see, we don't want a train uh, wreck to happen, and so we're going to try and avoid that train wreck by being proactive and moving on these accounting standards as quickly as possible. My uh, second favourite artist is Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob is slightly older than me, he's uh, 77. Uh, I've got all Bob Dylan's uh, albums and I've seen Bob Dylan in concert many times. One of his albums is, is um, real life, and so I thought that was quite appropriate for the accounting standards uh, coming through. So, as of 1 January, so if you're in December balances, you're real live into these accounting standards. Financial instruments, and don't forget there are two parts of the financial instruments uh, standard. Uh, there's the financial instruments, if you like, recognition, measurement, classification, which is the LFB9, 
and financial instruments disclosure. No one really understands financial instruments and these accounting standards don't make it any easier in that respect. AASB 15, revenue from contracts with customers applies just to not-for-profits for this year. So, uh, sorry, applies to for-profits for this year. So the not-for-profits get a reprieve from that standard to 1 January 2018. But just because you've got that reprieve for a year doesn't mean you should not be focusing on it now. There's also the guidance statement on making materiality judgments. And I think this is a fantastic piece of accounting literature. Uh, if you, it's a bit dense to uh, read and you've really got to uh, work your way through that particular piece of guidance to see what you should be reporting in the financial statements. And I'll touch on, on that uh, later on. Now, in relation to those uh, standards, if I was to talk to you about AASB 15, how long would it take me to explain AASB 15 to you? I'll just play audience participation time. There's sort of no right or wrong answers, but how long would it take me to go through AASB 15 for you? I'm almost at a bidding war. Start off with an hour. Uh, Terry, Terry, Terry bids one hour. I'm going to have any bigger bids than one hour. Five hours. Five hours. You're getting really close to it. Uh, we try to cover the water day. Um, we found that we can't do that. Uh, so <coughs> we, we do this for up to, I think, around about 12 or 5 hours. So if you wanted to really understand the new accounting standard on revenue, it's, it's, a, it's a day. So you, you day plus. So you go and say, well, that's really great, Colin. You've got uh, an hour and you've got plenty of an hour and a half and you've got plenty of things to cover. How possibly can we do with uh, 15? All chat with you I've done a deal for you. Great for me. Great for me. Uh, we run what we call webinars. Um, they're uh, one and a half hours on my accounting standards. And uh, we've organised with Bay Crane that uh, Kim will get uh, a number of our sessions on revenue and uh, she will, will provide the links to you for those. So you can listen to uh, Carmen Ridley uh, and myself uh, talk about uh, revenue. So at your leisure, so it's a recording. So over the weekend, when you're supposed to be uh, taking time off, to uh, the detail about uh, revenue. So, courtesy of uh, Hall Chadwick, uh, they've organised uh, uh, that for you, and I'll even throw in the introductory uh, one on leasing and, and financial instruments, just so. So, you've got about 10 hours of PD right there, courtesy of Hall Chadwick. So, that's how I plan to get you on the road to the, uh, to the new account. Uh, next one I want to uh, touch on is no Clark. And if anyone remember anything from my presentation last year, other than it was good sleeping time, <laughs> no Clark, non compliance with laws and regulations. This ethical standard came into force on 1 January this year, and basically it does a number of things. From an, uh, an audit perspective, it requires an auditor where they become aware of uh, a non-compliance with laws and regulations. The same with the payment inflation, very topical issue uh, currently. But if they became aware of an underpayment of uh, wages as a result of their uh, audit procedures, they would go to you as the uh, CFO and say, look, uh, there's an underpayment of uh, Wages, this is a breach of um, uh, legislation. Uh, do you know about it? And hopefully, you say, Oh, no, we didn't know about that. Or you, you might say, Well, it's part of our business model to do that. Uh, the auditors may well say, uh, Well, we've got a responsibility uh, under the Code of Ethics to see that this issue is resolved. Uh, therefore, uh, we suggest as auditors that you fix this. If you don't, uh, we have a professional obligation to act in the public interest to report this to the Fair Work Commission. That's just an example. 
So what has happened with this um, uh, standard is that the issue of client confidentiality uh, in, in relation to breaches of laws and regulations that are significant, no one replies. The auditor has an ethical responsibility uh, to report uh, the issue to uh, the appropriate regulator should you not act. So that is a specific requirement under uh, the ethical rules that also manifests itself in a legally backed order to stand. The auditors have uh, no option to follow that. You as preparers of uh, financial statements also have, sorry, you as preparers or accountants in uh, commerce, industry, and not for profits also have a responsibility to follow the no car requirements. In other words, the buck stops with you as CFOs, a member of the board. If there is non-compliance for law and regulation, you are required to fix that particular uh, problem. Can't let it linger. And in some cases, you may have to self-report to a uh, regulator depending upon what the various legislation goes. So all uh, preparers should be well aware of the requirements of NOCLAR and the Code of Professional Conduct. You should make your directors aware of those uh, responsibilities because uh, directors who are members of the accounting bodies have specific responsibilities in that space and you as a member of the C-suite also have uh, specific responsibilities. I'd expect all corporates, particularly the listed corporates, to have uh, an understanding and a policy and procedure in relation to no club. Because what you really don't want to happen is one of your uh, members of your team or somewhere within your organisation who's an accountant uh, and knows about the rules, takes the issue into their own hands without going through the chain of command within your organisation. So no club is an underrated uh, uh, risk that uh, you as a CFOs need to be aware of and manage. We have from one January 2019 uh, more standards coming into play. We have the leasing standard um, and income from for not for profit entities. So they're not too uh, far away in terms Coming live in relation to those, those standards we're into, uh, like the comparative period, and where we should have started to develop some policies and procedures in relation to these. If I can share with you uh, the comments of uh, BWC, because uh, just a small county. Well, perhaps they're not accounting firms anymore. I've seen the labour ones label themselves as professional <coughs> services firms. And some of the some of the larger firms may well end up jettisoning their auditing uh, practices. But it's another story for another day. So according to uh, uh, PwC, they did a survey of uh, 30 for June uh, financial reports, had a good look through them to find out whether or not those entities are making the transition uh, to the new suite of, of accounting uh, standards. And you would expect uh, these entities, being at the pinnacle of uh, financial reporting, would be well on top of those uh, new standards. And if we have a look at, at those uh, numbers there, we can see that for uh, AASP 9, <coughs> the financial instruments uh, standard, that only uh, 10 had really completed their uh, move to that particular standard. 57 had something in progress, we don't know the degree of progress, and 33 uh, had not indicated. So if they hadn't indicated, we can, does that mean that they really haven't started? Or does it mean that the uh, preparers haven't been doing their job in relation to uh, issuing and not get operative disclosures? We will get 15, which has significance to most, except those in the mining industry, because those in the mining industry don't have revenues. Uh, and we can see the very low number that have completed their assessments and uh, progress on uh, AISB 15. Uh, 
uh, six, 76% had it progress, no, that had not indicated. We go to the leasing standard, and the leasing standard seems to be the one that gets all the attention because people can sort of come to grips with the fact that uh, we've had uh, leases off balance sheet and they become on, on balance sheet, so really easy to grasp um, for that complete 76 in progress and 20 in not indicated. So if that's the top 100 uh, companies, uh, that's a pretty poor uh, result in that space. In relation to AAFP 15, it's particularly disappointing because that standard had a year of additional grace uh, after it was issued. So rather than the, uh, the two to three year formal, formal implementation, we gave you three to four. Standard setters don't give you an extra year because they're kind. They give you an extra year because the standard is tough. Okay. Now, this is a quote from the uh, from the report, and so I'll highlight it some words there. The issues are complex, so don't expect uh, when you're looking at those standards to have an easy read and for them and for you to be able to go like that and, and implement them. It's not like that at, at all. The next point is about significant changes to your uh, system. Uh, and have you started to think about how you're going to collect the information and report in particular in accordance with uh, AASB 15 and also the leasing uh, standard. Revenue will be a significant part of your uh, business at the end of the day. In my mind, you cannot continue to use your existing uh, management information system and, and get to the 30th of June and then use manual spreadsheets to, uh, to get to uh, the numbers. So getting back to um, the, the systems, you need to have the systems in, in, in play to uh, complete uh, the requirements for the revenue standard because the new revenue standard uh, bases uh, revenue recognition on uh, completing performance obligations. Your existing accounting systems are not set up for that. So you've really got to give some detailed consideration to the new standards. Now, we all know what a great firm, a great firm that uh, all Chadwick is. Successful, uh, long history of client satisfaction and the like. And you would love them to help you to outsource, if you like, these new standards to them, wouldn't you? So I, as a CFO, don't have to worry about these new standards because my auditors are going to uh, help me. Let me be crystal clear, and I'm speaking from Colin's point of view, not from Paul Chadwick uh, point of view. Can an audit firm help you implement these new accounting standards? And <coughs> The answer is really no. Because it's your responsibility as preparers to prepare accounts and auditors audit accounts. Let's not get the uh, roles confused. However, what the auditors can do under professional standards is that they can have a dialogue with you regarding your accounting treatments. And that dialogue means that they can start a conversation with you on the new accounting standards. And it could be like this. Uh, I'll be Graham for a moment, so imagine me uh, with an English accent. I go up to Kevin and I basically say uh, something like this. Mate, how are you going on the new uh, accounting uh, standards? And Kevin said, well, I'm really having some trouble uh, with those accounting standards, uh, can you help me? And Graham so forth will say, well, we'll start an audit dialogue, which I'm allowed to do under the, under the standards. You, and I can, based upon my knowledge of your business, I can have a discussion with you about some of the issues you should consider to sort of steer you in the right uh, direction. But they're your accounts at, at the end of the day. So you're going to have to come up with a, a series of accounting papers, uh, Kevin, and then we can discuss 
whether or not those accounting papers um, reflect uh, your business and comply with the accounting standards. Because believe it or not, these are new, and there are a lot of judgments in these accounting standards. So we're going to have to work through them. So Kevin, you're going to prepare some papers, and then we're going to have some meetings with uh, Graham and uh, Cindy. And we're going to go through uh, these, and uh, we'll come to a conclusion at the end of the day. Under the standards, we call this an iterative uh, process. So we can have the discussion, but we as, as your auditors can't give you the answer. We can tell you what we'll be satisfied with as auditors, but you're going to prepare your detailed accounting policy. I mean detailed accounting policy, not no one's the accounts. I expect an accounting policy. I expect that to contain uh, all the uh, information regarding uh, the uh, revenue standards. So I'm expecting to see uh, all your contracts, because that's the basis, so collect all the contracts. I expect to see information around those contracts that might be in emails or on a website that indicates other promises that you've made to people. So I need to go through that collection exercise. Then you're going to have to go through the contracts to identify the performance obligations in those contracts. Performance obligation is a promise to do something at the end of the day. So if you're going through your contracts, there should be maybe up to five key uh, performance uh, obligations. What I'm expecting is the completeness of, of information because if I haven't got all that information, I can't uh, do the contracts. To have the extraction of, of information to meet the requirements of, of the accounting standard, identifying the rights and, and obligations. And to make a series of judgments on the accounting standards that we reflect in, in those papers. That is not an, an easy job. I also expect the, uh, your accounting systems to change if the accounting systems change, uh, we're going to need an articulation of those uh, document flows and the internal controls over them. Because my audit uh, colleagues there, uh, Drew, for example, would say, you know, part of auditing is, is to look at your systems. If your systems have changed uh, for the new accounting standards, we need to look at those. Systems might include, should include, identifying uh, when the performance obligations are there. So, Drew is, uh, is the order is quite keen on looking at, at all of those systems and the accounting standards. So, there is a lot of work through the system, through understanding, through systems work, and through your year round uh, work. So, the responsibilities rest with you at the end of the day. Not with the auditors. The auditors can have that dialogue with you. You might put an accounting policy, a detailed accounting policy up to CMD, and they'll review it and say, Look, I think that there are some issues that aren't quite clear in your policy, or there are some issues that um, I think you should go back and take a look at as to whether or not you're complying. So you go away, and a week later on, you give CMD uh, a ring and say, Thanks for the discussion and the like, uh, I've updated my policy how, how do we go with that now. And send people will say from an audit perspective, we've addressed my concerns, I think those issues are now compliant. So that's the extent. Can they draft the accounting policy for you? Uh, the answer is no. And the business services people here at uh, our whole chapter uh, do that. If sort of have a Chinese wall at the end of the day, and the answer is uh, no. Because the extent to which they can help is very narrow to non-judgmental areas. And this account is never to judgmental. So <coughs> the answer is uh, no. Now a number of <coughs> accounting firms uh, that I've uh, spoken to haven't realised that that and have transgressed to those particular uh, boundaries that I've pointed out. Now, uh, to my mind, uh, 
places that are at risk in terms of uh, order and independence. And I do expect ASIC to uh, take a close look at it, uh, the, move, the transition to these new standards through their order and inspection program and what all of these people did do. So I've prepared this sort of uh, summary. I'm not going to go through the summary, but that's the point. Uh, yeah both auditors and preparers uh, to the relevant parts of the ethical standards that apply in this uh, circumstance. And it's not often that we as accountants delve into ethics, uh, and they should be more on the horizon, but there are some the references there. I take you to uh, the last uh, bullet point. I'll, I'll read that out. And this comes from uh, one of the ASIC uh, press releases. To maintain their independence, auditors should not be implementing new standards or advising on accounting treatments for their clients. Okay. Uh, from the media release uh, last year. Um, but auditors can have a dialogue. So be quite clear of the line of dialogue communication. Now a number of you uh, listed entities and it's great to be in the listed space because that's the on my real point again, a real challenge. I had the pleasure of working for a listed company uh, for a period of um, two years as, uh, as, a, as a financial advisor and the like, and I enjoyed that time uh, very much. Uh, company uh, listed uh, at dollar 40, so there was a nice uh, profit on day one, 40 cents. In very uh, thin trading, it hit um, two dollars thirteen. So I was quite pleased as a shareholder and not shareholder in that. And a year or later, they went out the back door. So my wife in a listed company, uh, and it was a listed accounting firm that made matters uh, even even worse. So I've had some experience in the listed environment, but I digress. So WSB uh, 34, Interim uh, Financial uh, Reporting. It's a standard that hasn't changed uh, since we moved to the uh, IFRS back in uh, 2005, 2006, except for minor changes. But I thought it would be appropriate to at least uh, touch on some of the uh, requirements and how this might affect your uh, reporting for uh, 30th of June if you're a December balancer or if you're a June balance of how it's going to affect your uh, 31 December in your account. So if we would remember under uh, the interim reporting standard, we, can, we have the choice of doing a complete set of uh, financial reports or a condensed set. Most choose the condensed uh, uh, financial report. But if you did a complete set of financial statements, you required a third balance sheet. Show the movements to uh, the new standards. Remember uh, that if we're in uh, if we're in December balancer, the 30th of June financial uh, report, the interim financial report will be in accord with the new standards. So if you're in December balancer and have not uh, not on top of, of the revenue standard and the financial instrument standard, you've got a very very short time in which to uh, make that up. So be alive for the 30th of June interim financial statements. First cap off the rank if you like, except for those who are adopted. One of the key points of the interim financial uh, standards is essentially we've got to explain what happened uh, compared to our previous full set of financial statements. <coughs> so while uh, double A is putting a 134, it doesn't make any explicit references to 15 and 9. One's got to be read the interim standard and know the types of general disclosures that we need to make. And that's what I've done there in the, um, the last quarter. Explanation of events and transactions that are significant to an understanding of the changes in the financial position and performance of the entity. So as the entities have moved to these uh, new standards, in the interim accounts, I would expect a fair degree of uh, discussion of those, of those impacts. 
over and above what we would have done under mission and not being operative. So very important to give detailed consideration to the extent of disclosures to make in those uh, financial statements, income financial statements. 30th of June for December, 31 December for the 3rd of June next year. Uh, so concentrate on those. A couple other points that I've uh, pulled out of uh, 134. Because there have been changes in account policies, we have to give a description of the nature and effect of those uh, changes. So other than those general uh, observations that I made on the previous slide, the specific requirements in relation to the changes. Also, this was one of the changes that, that came through with the revenue standard. It basically says there are some paragraphs in WASB 15, I'll put them there, that you need to make in the interim financial statements and explain the, uh, the references, uh, the disaggregation of uh, revenue uh, to the segment reporting. Uh, no. So to help you along the way, I've uh, identified those paragraphs in the standards themselves, and the reference to the Bs is the implementation guidance in the standard, which goes into uh, the detail. So getting uh, back to my dialogue with uh, all the uh, the the issue would be uh, as the, the CFO I've prepared uh, these uh, notes and explanations in accordance with the uh, reporting standard. Uh, Drew, can you uh, go through uh, these and see that they meet uh, your uh, satisfaction based upon your perspective and your understanding of the internal reporting standard? come back and, and so we go. We think you're in the zone, but uh, a couple of these line items really sort of don't make uh, sense and you've missed this particular aspect of the disclosure requirements. And so uh, there'll be some notes of that particular meeting and the one that Drew is off site as we'll uh, put on the audit file and then a uh, future meeting we'll, we'll see that uh, those issues have been discussed and uh, resolved. Wouldn't be uh, likely to uh, not comment on the, the role of directors and, and management during the day. Now, these are actually quotes uh, that, that I haven't put uh, quote marks around from uh, ASIC at the end of the day. So again, it, it really is a stretching thing that uh, directors and responsible for financial statements at the end of the day. And perhaps uh, some directors and, and CFOs have really lost the knowledge or not acquired the knowledge of the detail of these new accounting standards. The primary onus is on you as preparers to understand and implement these new accounting standards. I know that you have a number of other things to do in the business and this is seen as a compliance exercise. Uh, to my mind, it is your number one responsibility to ensure that, in particular, we get the revenue recognition standard uh, better uh, now. So you can't, according to ASIC and the ethical rules, simply rely upon the auditor to do these things for you. As I said, the standards themselves are, uh, are complex. And if you like one of my New Zealand clients, recall my story from my last year, they were a construction company, they had 1,100 uh, contracts. Contracts were each individual contracts and the contracts were in different jurisdictions throughout uh, Southeast Asia. <coughs> they had to start uh, on that uh, analysis and uh, systems changes and extraction of information from the contracts from day one when this account standard was issued around about three years ago so that they could meet their requirements and they have a team to do that. So you need the uh, appropriate expertise and experience with these uh, standards at the end of the day and as I said they're not easy to read, they're not easy to understand 
every time that I present on uh, these standards or listen to my colleague Carmen Newley, I actually learn something. So I'm in a continuous learning uh, Cams. Funny cam firms that uh, I do, small cam firm that I do some work for. Uh, the order partner there is a racing uh, fanatic. And uh, when I mentioned uh, cams, uh, obviously it has something to do with car racing. And he was really thrilled that he thought I was going to talk about uh, car racing. Uh, to which I had to say, uh, Robert, mate, I don't even drive. So I can't talk to you about car racing or anything like that. So cams, keyword matters, uh, we've had them now uh, coming up for, for the season, I think. So another uh, <coughs> county firm has done a, a great bit of work on uh, providing the cams, uh, if you like, inventory of what county, what order does that been recorded in the space. And I've, list, I've listed the uh, top five cans. Now, other than uh, doing that, it's really the uh, burgundy colour there, which is the important uh, issue uh, to consider uh, for uh, the whole chat uh, over on top of this. And also, because of the relationship with CAMS and the financial reports, does the transition to new accounting standards uh, a CAM? And I, I, I believe it does. Uh, so, there is an example in uh, the audit reporting literature about a major change to the IT system and the auditors, because of the importance of the IT system to the financial reporting, spend a significant amount of time in looking at the changes to that system. So I see a parallel between the, uh, that example in the audit literature to the transition to our CAMs. Um, to the transition of these new standards as a can. So I would be expecting, and my expectations are often dashed by the way, that I would be expecting in the 30th of June reporting period to see a number of listed company auditors reporting cans in relation to the transition to the new accounting standards because for the 30th of June balances, you have uh, been through the the balance sheet, the balance sheet should have been done, and the comparative figures should have been done. Uh, some work should have been done on the accounting policies and systems. So I would be expecting uh, firms to be reporting CAMs in relation to those uh, standards uh, 15 and 9, and perhaps to a lesser extent uh, 16, which is a lesser standard as we're still a year away from that and I would expect to, to see that. If there is reporting of CAMs in relation to these new standards, then CAMs sort of interacts with the disclosures made in your account. So we want to see that the disclosures relating to issue and not yet operative are very fulsome in this space. So I can now deal with a number of uh, smaller uh, items. Uh, that come through for this uh, reporting period. I'm just going to touch on these because um, in the uh, winter edition of uh, the Hall Chadwick uh, Corporate Advisor, uh, there will be an explanation of these uh, minor irritants at the end of the day. So the first uh, change is to the uh, cash uh, flow statement where there are some <coughs> minor disclosure requirements regarding uh, financing activities and the, essentially the, the standard requires that reconciliation and I'll put a, uh, how that reconciliation uh, might look uh, for those financing activities. The next uh, item is that there are uh, four standards that, that uh, are operative, they have minor uh, changes to them and as I said, the, uh, as I'll be assisting uh, Graham and, and the team with that the newsletter, I can guarantee you that all the will be going through those minor changes and tell you precisely what you have to do. Because if I look at those uh, four uh, topics, 
Okay. We've got about 30 people in the room. One or two of you will be uh, affected by those, uh, but not everyone. We have some large proprietary uh, companies uh, in the audience today, and I want to touch on this particular issue. And uh, you recall that if I'm a large proprietary company, I have to watch my accounts and uh, in general I have to monitor them. Now, it's a self assessment process. What a number of clients, and not the Paul Chapman, of course, but those other naughty account firms have been doing, is that they've um, breached the thresholds, um, really not been monitoring them, um, because it's self reporting. Shh, no, I don't know. I don't watch my accounts. But uh, these days of data matching, uh, the regulators have got a bit smarter and uh, the ATO and ASIC are really talking to each other with uh, dreadful results at the end of the day for some. So uh, ASIC actually got a list of a thousand entities, private companies, um, revenue and assets, ASIC wrote to uh, those uh, entities and basically said, we think that uh, you're a life and private company and should be watching your accounts. And so a thousand of these letters uh, went out and a uh, number of the companies uh, had to uh, watch accounts. Now the issues in this space is that how do you determine those numbers of revenue and assets, we have accounting standards that address both those issues. A number of those entities would have prepared special purpose financial reports in the past where they probably haven't, haven't given a great thought to the proper application of accounting standards. So we had to work with a number of accounting firms to, to go through and firm up the numbers as to whether or not they actually did breach those thresholds or not. And we also had to we should consider the issue of consolidation. A number of these uh, private uh, groups that uh, have their own unique structures, and we had to go through those structures and apply the consolidation standard to, uh, to, to see if they're meeting their requirements, or to reply back to us and say, well, while we understand that you have uh, said that they uh, might be large, when we run the numbers, uh, they're not, and for these reasons. So once they uh, meet the, uh, the, the threshold, uh, what are the options for reporting? It's a special purpose uh, financial reports, and I'll touch on that uh, later on. Uh, RDR, which is reduced disclosures, uh, means you apply all the recognition and admission of requirements and accounting standards. So the disclosures are significantly reduced by a checklist, if you like, prepared by the WSB, and then for general purpose financial reports. It wouldn't be uh, complete for me not to touch upon dividends. Because dividend payments, as you will be aware, have gone uh, to the solvency uh, issues rather than profitability issues. So uh, we, can, uh, we must not pay a dividend unless those three conditions are met. So again, as, a, as an advisor and when you're paying uh, dividends, I would expect an entity to have a paper uh, that went to the board that would, uh, in essence, say that we've met the requirements in relation to payment dividends, in relation to solvency. Now, just remember, it's really good if you can tie the payment of dividends in with uh, some periodic accounting uh, point, like a year in accounts or interim accounts. Uh, if you're paying dividends uh, during the year away from those accounting periods, just really make sure the numbers are solid in that space. Tax rates. Uh, Tre Treasurer uh, Morrison has been rapiding on about uh, tax rates and more and big changes uh, being in the market and others. Uh, if the legislation gets through. Now, legislation uh, has been uh, debated, has not passed through the Parliament, and as such is not substantially enacted. 
And so it doesn't uh, pose a problem for us until it passes through our parliament. A couple of years ago, we had some changes to the tax rates. And I'll pull out uh, the schedule there. And you can see how over time, depending on the turnover, the company tax rates uh, change. So just bear in mind those particular uh, turnover rates, and you can see the 2018 turnover of over uh, $25 million comes within the 20.5% tax rate, and later on over $50 million uh, within the lower tax rates. Your future income tax uh, benefits, future tax, income tax liabilities, need to be based upon those particular rates. So a level of detailed calculation is, is required in that space. So it's an easy thing to uh, forget. You know, these rates came in 2016. Sometimes we lose these things in the midst of time. Special purpose uh, financial statements to end. Um, I have the pleasure of being on the uh, Accountants Dance Board from 2006 to uh, 2009. And at the last meeting, uh, we got very close to issuing a standard which would have basically said if you're watching financial statements, we're basically prepare full general purpose financial statements. No special purpose financial reports. If any of your reporting mandates said presents fairly or true and fair, when those words we use, we prepare full general purpose financial reports. Unfortunately, at our last uh, meeting, we had a change of chairman, a change of common, and a new board was appointed. And so, rather than just fracking uh, the decisions of the old board, they did the standard setters do, they fluff around. They said, we need more academic research to support our uh, uh, position when all of us around that table knew uh, that the accounting for special purpose financial reports was for. There's also a change of government when uh, Tony became uh, Prime Minister and Tony didn't want any more red tape. And so the board got the, the inkling from uh, Treasury that a, a move to require all entities lodging financial statements with ASIC to prepare general purpose financial statements who will fly. So, almost uh, a decade later, uh, it is now going to change for reasons not related to that story that I told you, uh, but to uh, a new conceptual framework being issued that uses the term reporting entity totally foreign to our Australian grain reporting entity. So the board is currently going through a consultation process that will see uh, special purpose financial statements um, not being allowed for uh, management purposes. So in that space, as uh, Drew and um, Senator Graham and Ron follow that particular issue and, and some of their clients that you know, we're in the home so it's straight that things can change in relation to these issues between uh, now and 2020. 